When asking the emperor some medical questions, he recounted the following anecdote. About seven years ago, the Persian ambassador in Paris fell sick and ordered a physician to be sent for. The messenger, not properly comprehending what he meant, thought that he wished to see a minister of the treasury to whom he went and informed him that the Persian ambassador desired to speak to him. The minister, surprised, said, This is a curious mode of acting, but those barbarians know nothing of etiquette, or perhaps he has something important to communicate. On his arrival, the ambassador held out his wrist that he should feel his pulse, whilst another great fellow with a turban brought a chamber utensil, which he held up to his nose for inspection. You may judge how the minister was confounded at such a reception. Theft. Napoleon remained in bed very late, not having had any sleep during the night, found him not risen at eleven. Saw him once more in the course of the day and had some more conversation about his brother Lucian. He observed again on the cruelty and injustice of persecuting a literary character who did not meddle in politics and who had even quarreled with him. To persecute a man from whom no danger was to be apprehended two years after he, Napoleon, had been sent to St. Helena was the height of injustice. Such fear of an individual shows that they are conscious of acting contrary to the will of the people. Les tyrans tremblant peu le suis. Here he made a quotation about Pluto, trembling lest the earth should open and expose to view all the horrors of the infernal regions. What a degradation, added he, to see the ambassador of one of the greatest powers in Europe persecuting an individual who has never been nor ever desired to be a sovereign. Quando io sarò morto e forse il giorno no, lontano John Bomi vendicherà. When I am dead, and perhaps the day is not far off, John Bolt will revenge me. Napoleon then recounted to me some private anecdotes of Lucian. He also told me that one Ignatio Laurie, I think that was the name, a Corsican and a foster brother of his, had early in life embraced the English party and entered their sea service. He was ignorant, though. Un brassivimo homo. And an excellent seaman, he commanded an English store ship and landed in blank, where he went disguised as a peasant to see the French consul. When he came into his presence, continued Napoleon, he threw off his capote, showed the English uniform, and told who he was. He made many inquiries concerning me without, however, offering to enter my service. The consul did not believe him and wrote a long history to Paris of an impostor who had presented himself to him and asserted himself to be the emperor's foster brother. He was much astonished to find that I admitted it to be perfectly true. It is surprising that during all the height of my power, this man never asked a favor of me, although in his childhood he loved me and knew that since my elevation, I had loaded his mother with favors and money. Sixth, Napoleon, in rather better spirits, otherwise much the same, spoke to me about an article which he had seen in the paper stating that Talma had paid a reckoning for him at a tavern once, when, through the want of money, he had offered his sword and pledge. This he declared to be untrue. I did not know Talma personally, continued he, until I was first consul. I then favored and distinguished him very much as a man of talent and the first in his profession. I sometimes sent for him in the morning to discourse with me while I was at breakfast. The libeler said that Talma taught me how to act the king. When I returned from Elba, I said one morning at my breakfast to Talma, who was present with some other men of science, it be in Talma. So they say that you taught me how to sit upon my throne. C'est un signe que je me tiens bien. It's a sign that I do it well. Count Bellamine and Baron Sturmer had a long interview with General Monsalon yesterday. They rode up to the inner gate where they remained for some time looking in. Signals are made to Plantation House whenever they come near Longwood, and a spy is generally sent to dog them from the town, but no direct attempts are made to prevent their intercourse with the inhabitants of Longwood. Eighth, Napoleon observed that I walked lame and asked me if I had the gout. I replied in the negative and said that it had been caused yesterday by a tight boot.
that I never had the gout and never had been confined in my bed a day in my life by illness. He then asked if my father had ever had that disease and said that he would prescribe for my present complaint by ordering me to eat nothing drink barley water, and keep my leg up on a sofa during the day. He then made some observations about his son and said that his having been disinherited from the succession to Parma gave him little or no uneasiness. If he lives, added he, he will be something. As to those contemptible little states, I would rather see him a private gentleman with enough to eat than sovereign any of them. Perhaps it may, however, grieve the empress to think that he will not inherit after her. But it does not give me the smallest trouble. The Emperor Francis, added he, whose head is crammed with ideas of high birth, was very anxious to prove that I was descended from some of the old tyrants of Treviso. And after my marriage with Marie Louise employed diverse persons to search into the old musty records of genealogy, in which they thought they could find something to prove, what they desired, he imagined that he had succeeded at last and wrote to me asking my consent that he should publish the account with all official formalities. I refused. He was so intent upon this favorite object that he again applied and said, Laissez-moi faire, let me do it, that I need not appear to take any part in it. I replied that this was impossible, as if published. I should be obliged to take notice of it, and I preferred being the son of an honest man to being descended from any little dirty tyrant of Italy, that I was the Rudolph of my family. There was formerly, added he, one Bonaventura Bonaparte who lived and died as a monk. The poor man lay quietly in his grave. Nothing was thought about him until I was on the throne of France. It was then discovered that he had been possessed of many virtues which never had been attributed to him before, and the Pope proposed to me to canonize him. Saint Père, said I. Pour la de Dieu, épargnez-moi le ridicule de cela. Holy Father, please save me the ridicule of all this. You being in my power, all the world will say that I forced you to make a saint out of my family. 25th signal made for me to go to Plantation House, where I found Sir Hudson Law, who interrogated me upon various matters that had taken place at Longwood and the conversations I had with Napoleon. I replied that I had formed a determination not to meddle with what did not concern me and only troubled myself about my professional pursuits. He said that I must have had some conversation not medical with him and demanded to be informed of the subject of the conversation I had with General Bonaparte. I replied, that in the first place, nothing important had taken place. That in the next, I did not think myself bound to repeat the subject of such conversations as I had with Napoleon unless permitted or unless matters came to my knowledge connected with my allegiance or of great importance to my own government. Sir Hudson replied, you are no judge, sir, of the importance of the conversations you may have with General Bonaparte. I might consider several subjects of great importance which you consider as trifling or of no consequence. I observed that I was not at liberty to use my own discretion on our judgment. I must necessarily repeat to him everything I heard, which would place me in the situation of a man acting a most dishonorable and disgraceful part. The governor replied that it was my duty to inform him of what circumstances came to my knowledge and of the subject of my conversation with General Bonaparte. For if I did not... It was easily in his power to permit me, to prohibit me from holding any communication with him except on medical subjects, and then only when sent to for that purpose, that it was a duty I owed to the English government. I answered that it would be acting the part of a spy, an informer, and a mouton that I never understood the government had placed me about him for other than medical purposes, that my duty did not require me to commit dishonorable actions, and that I would not do so for any person. Sir Hudson remained silent for a few moments, eyed me furiously, and asked, what was the meaning of the word mouton? I replied, mouton means a person who insinuates himself into the confidence of another for the purpose of betraying it. 
Sir Hudson then broke out into a paroxysm of rage, said that I had given him the greatest possible insult in his official capacity that could be offered, and concluded with ordering me to leave the room, saying that he would not permit a person who had made use of such language to sit in his presence. I told him that I did not voluntarily come into nor ever would have entered his house unless compelled to do so. He walked about in a frantic manner, repeating in a boisterous tone, Leave the room, sir, which he continued bawling out for some moments after I had actually quitted it. The following narrative may convey some idea of the manner in which Lieutenant General Sir Hudson Lowe, K-C-B-E-T-C, E-T-C, was duped when he had the command of an important fortress. It was communicated to me at Longwood, principally by the maitre d'hotel, Cipriani, whose name was also Francesi, but which latter he never assumed at St. Helena for reasons which will be seen ha- hereafter. In 1806, Sir Hudson, then Lieutenant Colonel Lowe, was entrusted with the command of the island of Capri, which is situated in the Bay of Naples, and with the Secret Service, or in plainer terms, the espionage of the continent, at least as far as regarded the Mediterranean and the island he commanded. He generally received intelligence from the city of Naples, from which it is distant only a few miles. It was most generally brought to him by means of a fishing boat, commanded by a man named Antonio, who went out at night under pretense of fishing. Sir Hudson employed a spy, Antonio Susanelli, a Corsican and a man of talent who had been educated as a lawyer, along with Pozzo di Borgo and Salicetti the then minister of police at Naples. Suzarelli had formerly been an officer in the English service, Maresca, a Neapolitan, and Chiaroscolo, another Neapolitan, were also employed by him on a similar service, and Cassetti, a Neapolitan lieutenant colonel of Dragoons, was a spy for Queen Caroline of Sicily. Suzarelli remained faithful to Sir Hudson, though, for about 20 days, viz. from the 19th or 20th of January to the 10th of February, when some dispatches of his were taken in a boat going over to Capri at a tavern. He met Capriani Franceschi, who was then in the confidential service of Salicetti, supposed to be his natural son, and generally known by the name of Franceschi. Being countrymen and intimate acquaintances, Suzarelli confided to Francesi the nature of his employment, informing him also that he had received a certain sum monthly from the English government. Cipriani proposed to him to apparently continue to furnish information to the governor of Capri and receive his salary, but at the same time really to communicate everything to Salicetti and obey his directions, adding that he then would be paid double what he received from the English, and insinuating that should he refuse, in all probability he would be in two or three weeks. Discovered and shot, Suzarelli, who was no novice, took the hint immediately, closed with the proposal, and was brought before Salicetti, from whom he received instructions how to act. Suzarelli also brought over Marelska and Crisculo to the same mode of acting, partly by promises and partly by threats. Cassetti also became a spy on the Queen for Salicetti. All of them were paid double what they received from the other parties. Matters were ordered so that when ever Suzarelli received a dispatch from Sir Hudson Lowe, it was immediately brought to Salicetti in the state in which it had been received, who, after reading it, dictated such answers as he thought proper. Sometimes Suzarelli was permitted to tell the truth, for example. While the French troops were in great force in Naples, he was directed to mention their number whenever it related to an affair which Salicetti did not like to answer directly. He caused the master of the boat and his crew to be arrested and thrown into confinement for some days when, after some forms of examination had been gone through, they were released. This also gave an opportunity for Suzarelli to exercise his talents in obtaining more money from Sir Hudson by inventing tales of the trouble he had been at 
and the expenses he had incurred in paying bribes to save those poor devils who otherwise would have been shot. In this manner, the whole of the information furnished to the British government was only such as answered the ends of Salicetti and consequently of the Emperor Napoleon except what trifling intelligence Sir Hudson could glean from the master of the boat and his sons who were faithful to him but were ignorant of everything of importance. Commissions of the most difficult nature were frequently sent by Sir Hudson Lowe to Suzerelli to execute, which by order Salichati were done with the greatest punctuality and dispatch. Among others, there was some expensive French watches for Queen Caroline, scarce books, and all recent publications for Sir Hudson, particularly a copy of Las Casas' Atlas then called Lesages, to obtain which he was very anxious. This also afforded honest Suzerelli another opportunity of gaining money from Sir Hodson, for although he was ordered by Salicetti to furnish the articles at prime cost with a reasonable charge for expenses in order to prevent suspicion, he never failed to lay on from 50 to 100 percent under different pretenses. He practiced smuggling. Also, to a considerable extent, Sir Hudson frequently paying for the articles he received in English or colonial goods, which Suzerella used afterwards to sell at Naples at a large profit.